Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. We have a very special guest um, joining us from Orlando, Florida, uh, Larry Rinker. He, um, he, he's he been a fixture on the PGA Tour at times, uh, quite a lengthy career. Uh, played in 525 PGA Tour events, uh, made 283 career cuts, um, went through uh, Q School uh, four times you graduated through Q, Q School, eh, Larry? That's correct. <laughs> but you've shifted, and I don't really know. Uh, you've shifted into golf instruction, and and like I said earlier before we started the recording, I'm one of your biggest fans uh, for various reasons, uh, because what you teach works. Um, also, because when you publish something, uh, it doesn't take 10 minutes to watch it. So... That's what I think you're most successful um, at in my eyes is that you can convey a message really, really uh, concisely. And that's something that we emphasize with all our, our new instructors here in Canada that uh, you don't need to tell them why in a thesis on everything, explain, uh, explain the, how to get it done and how to do it efficiently. And I think you, you're the epitome of that. Um, so, Larry, if you if you want to maybe just give us a couple of, you know, uh, reasons how you got into golf instruction from playing. And uh, I can tell by your videos that it is a passion and that, you know, you also have the passion to uh, to tell the public out there to get good instruction. And I and I respect that because uh, being uh, in the industry for a long time, my whole life, pretty much, uh, I've seen some really poor instruction and I've seen quality instruction. And uh, anyways, we'll, we'll turn it over to you. I know we have, we're going to get a presentation here from you as well. Um, for all our members, we're going to ask you to mute. If you do have a question, we're going to put it in the chat. Uh, and Jeff and I will, will watch the chat, but we are going to have a question and answer at the end. So if you can hold your, your questions uh, for Larry at the end, we appreciate it. So Larry, it, it's all yours and we're all going to mute, um, hopefully, mm -hmm. and including me. Take well, it away. Thanks, Mark. And thanks for inviting me uh, for this continuing education seminar for the Canadian uh Teachers Federation. It's always great to uh, be with fellow professionals, fellow teachers. And, you know, you said it in what you just said there. At the end of the day, what we tell our students, it's got to work. And it's, it's amazing how you could spend three hours with someone. And at the end of the day, you just tell them that, their grip is too strong. They need to get the grip a little more neutral. And now they can release it more with your hands going through. That that's the lesson at the end of the day. I had a lesson like that in the last couple of weeks with a two handicap. So it's, it's amazing how I always try to circle back to what's simple. And I always try to, you know, what are the three key things that we really said? I try to stay out of the weeds as much as I can. I've learned that less is more, especially with the ladies. That if I get a little too technical, they uh, they don't understand it as well as a whole. So, and I've come up with some things with ladies that, you know, I've helped them. I, and again, that's the whole thing. Does it work? And I think your passion really has to be, it, that's a big part. And you can't fake passion. You have it or you don't have it. I just, I've loved the game my whole life. I started playing when I was six years old. I was playing state junior tournaments at the age of 12. And the rest is kind of history after that. And then after playing, I my game deteriorated. I struggled hitting the ball straight i was still world class inside 100 yards so that's how when i started teaching my niche was a short game guy and i had a nice story to tell because i was the pga tour putting leader in 1990 
my peers would say I had a great short game. So that's how I got started working with some juniors here around Orlando. And next thing I knew, uh, I took an assistant pro job where I taught a lot. And one thing led to another. And I got an opportunity in Vail, Colorado to be the director of instruction out there in 2010. And, and then it's just gone from there. And really blessed and lucky to get to be the director of instruction at the Ritz Carlton here in Orlando. I think that's one of the toughest things. I think you all would agree. But one of the toughest things as an instructor is to find a great place to teach and a place that uh, appreciates that you're there and a place that appreciates what you do. And that's always a hard thing to do. And it takes time. So sometimes you just got to pay your dues and and, you know, God will open that door for you and you, you'll you'll get somewhere and, and get to a place where you know, you can be who you want to be and, and teach. But I'll say this, uh, just kind of an opening statement. I think I think we could divide the aisle of golf instructors with saying we have one side of the aisle that believes they teach the same swing and the same thing to everybody. And then you have another side of the aisle that we got to work with what people have. So I'm obviously on that side. I work with what people have. And I think right balance, which has been Mark's intrigue with me, is right balance has helped us to identify what people are. And I say it on my website. I say it in lessons. To me, the less I change about somebody's swing, the better. Because at the end of the day, we all have to own our own swing. And if we don't own our swing or we're trying to do too much, I can tell you from professional experience, that doesn't work very well. I think another thing where we could divide the uh, beliefs is we have one side of the aisle that believes the big muscles control the little muscles. The little muscles are your arms, hands, and wrists. And then we have another side of the aisle that says, if you want to be any good at this game, you got to learn how to control a golf club with your arms, hands, and wrists. And then a lot of times the big muscles know how to move to support what you're trying to do with your arms, hands, and wrist, and what you're trying to do with a golf club to have that golf club interact with the golf ball to make the golf ball do what you want it to do. So I, I call that kind of the culture. I think especially like putting, if you teach putting with your shoulders, that's your engine. You don't use your hands and wrists and you keep the triangle to me, that's big muscles. So that's just not what I believe. That's not what I teach. And I could I could spend 10 or 15 minutes debunking just that. Uh, it, it's pretty interesting how we have in our brain, we have the frontal motor cortex, which controls the movement of our body. And they have a thing called the humunculus, which diagrams in size where the brain power is. And there's more brain power going to our hands than any other part of our body. So if you don't know what your hands are doing when you play golf, Lee Trevino said, you're dead. I truly 100% agree with that. So it's amazing how many times I give a golf lesson and people, I talk about their hands and they say, well, nobody's ever talked to me about my hands. They just said, turn back, turn through and have a world-class finish, whatever that means. So a lot with what I talk about is what our arms, hands, and wrists do. And what that is, is it's different for everyone. So I'm going to share this. Uh, I'm going to share this slide with everybody. Hopefully you're full screen and can see this. But uh this is uh, Right Balance, Three Swing Models, Dr. David Wright. Uh, he is the one that, uh, you know, really came up with this. It's pretty amazing. Here's Dr. Wright. Uh, he holds two doctorates. He's a full-time member of the faculty of the University of Southern California School of Medicine for four years. He's been a golf professional since 1982. 
And he was the one that set up the research design, wrote the protocols, and ran the balance study for the duration of the project. This project was done 2003 to 2007. And one thing that's really interesting is your stance width, what width you're in in your stance, determines where the balance is in your feet. And that's always something that's pretty interesting with this. Uh, we also have uh, one of the doctors, and they actually did the study in Dr. Frank Job's uh, lab at the Curlin Job Institute out at Sentinel Hospital in Los Angeles. But Dr. Job is best known for doing the Tommy John surgery uh, that has saved the careers of many athletes. And ironically, in 1984, the PGA Tour for the first time had a mobile fitness center that traveled the tour, and Dr. Job was our orthopedic. So it's kind of interesting how this is intertwined with the PGA Tour. Michael Melman, uh, his thing that he brought was uh, the carrying angle. We'll talk about that. But uh, a lot about the carrying angle. The carrying angle actually dictates your grip. And then Robert Watkins was another doctor. Uh, he did Dwight Howard's back surgery, Peyton Manning's neck surgeries. His client list is who's who. He has so many people he's worked with. James Smith was a physicist. He's actually Dr. Wright's brother-in-law. Found that out a couple of years ago. And here are the nine core regions of the body. Seven, eight, nine is upper core. Four, five, six is mid. One, two, three is low. Every student will have a number what they are. If you look at that top to bottom, and really I think the big thing in golf instruction today is things have to match up. Your grip has to match how rotated your hips are. So the nine, which I am, we are going to have our hips the least rotated and have the most neutral grip. If we go down to the five, that's your average tour player mid-core, which would have their hips rotated 40 to 45 degrees at impact. And let's just say they can see two knuckles on their lead hand. And then three, two, one, we go into low core. One would be your Dustin Johnson, who's rotated more than 60 degrees, probably 70 degrees or more at impact and has the strongest grip on tour. So why is that? It's a match. So a strong grip matches a big hip rotation, and then not a lot of hip rotation matches a nine. When we look at this, you can see the yardstick on the ground. All of those core regions, we measure you. They've come up with an algorithm. It's amazing. But when you stand in your nine, your upper core stance with your weight is in the balls of your feet. When you stand two inches narrower in your one, your weight goes to the middle of your feet. I've done this 1,400 times. It is amazing. So your balance affects what you can and can't do with your body as well. So let's look at some of the matchups here. So here's your low core grip. Just think of Dustin Johnson, Lee Trevino in his prime. Daniel Berger, Paul Azinger, David Duvall. They have the strongest grip. Your pivot. They move the most lateral in the golf swing. So they're going to pivot around their trail leg, right leg for right-hander. They have the most lateral motion in the backswing with the least amount of rotation. And then the hips are rotated the most impact. And they have the latest release. I'll show you some videos on this. Your mid-core player, this is what most people teach. So that grip is two knuckles. They're going to be rotated somewhere 35 to 55 degrees at impact. They are a center pivot. They're going to move in between their feet. And they have that mid-release point. And then upper core, which most of us are, 
have the most neutral grip pivot around the front leg. We have the least lateral motion and the most rotary on the backswing. We rotate on the backswing and then we actually have a little shift and rotate into a jump and we our hips are the least rotated impact and we have the earliest release. So this is a picture of the carrying angle. So when someone stands in their dominant core region, whatever they are, one through nine, we measure that angle with that goniometer. That's what that thing's called. And that actually ends up being the same angle for your grip. Now, this is going to be hard to believe, but if your grip is correct, you can maximize how much you can rotate on your backswing. If your grip is incorrect, it will limit how much you can rotate and you will feel pulling in your back. Your right hand grip, these are for a right hand a golfer, your right hand grip affects how rotate how you can rotate on your forward swing. So pretty interesting. A lot of people, their grips match. So the you know the left and right hand are on the same angle. And then you've probably seen some golfers with the right hand on top for a right-handed player. And we measure people that they can turn more with the right hand on top than with the right hand here. And so um, they're an on-top player. They, they've got their right hand on top. And then if your hands are like this, then that ends up being that that's where now I'm holding the club in my carrying angle. And then I can bend down from there, and that gives ball position, too. We also can measure the middle finger of both hands, and we measure the width of the hand, and we can determine what size grips are best for you. So those are those are just some things. Uh, I'm not sure if it's rightbalance.com is his... Uh, just Google right balance if you want to find out more. Truth is, Doc has a lot of videos on YouTube that he's put out. And I've put a, a bunch out on YouTube as well. So that's just a little bit of a, a PowerPoint presentation there for you. Now I'm going to bring up some videos so we can actually look at this. So you guys can see this. So. On the left is my sister, Lori. She is your mid-core queen. So notice left arm perfectly on plane, club just under the plane, and then there, there is impact. There's those hips rotated 40 to 45 degrees. On the right is one of my students, Kathleen. She is low core. Low core is going to have the most knee flex with the weight in the middle of the feet. And they have the strongest grip. So if you can do this like Kathleen can, I will teach you how to swing like a low core player. If you can look like that. Now, I've only measured 14 low core players out of 1,400. They are very rare. Then you have yours truly. And so here I am. So you're going to see me at the top, left arm on plane. I've got the club under the plane, which I call the power slot. That means I'm going to swing out and up. And there I am standing up, coming out of posture, and I jump and look like that. So how many people do you know that teach that can say both of these pictures are okay? Most people would put up someone else and say, you need to swing like this. So when I was playing the tour, I had a teacher tell me, I got to find it here. I added some videos. But I had a teacher tell me, well, your model is David Tom's, and you need to look like this at impact. And I was drinking the Kool-Aid. I was believing that. So the thing I say a lot is one thing upper core players do is we stand up, come out of posture. We early extend. They want to say that's bad. 
That's that's fine if you're mid core or low upper core, excuse me. Mid core is going to stay in posture. And David Toms is pretty rotated. He could almost, he's probably between a mid and low core player here. Uh, anyway, they say we early extend or come out of posture. The other thing is, is they will say our hips are not rotated enough, and then they'll tell us we release early. And to me, I've you've seen the videos, Mark. I say if someone tells you you're not rotated enough, you're coming out of posture and releasing early, I say run because you're upper core. Folks, I'm only running 90% upper core. Now, I work with old people, okay? I work with old people. And speaking of old people, I think it's, let's see. I saved him here. Here we go. Here's an old Lee Trevino. This was five years ago. Now, this Mary Max, look at the bowed left wrist. Look at him. Look at where he is at impact today. Nowhere near as rotated as he was in his prime. Okay. See, here's Paul Azinger, who's older now, but in his prime, he was low core. Look at the face shut at the top, even with the cup left wrist. And look how rotated he is in impact. Well, guess what? Lee Trevino used to look even more rotated than that in his prime, but look at him at 77. So I couldn't, two years ago, I said, Lee, I got a question for you. Have you made your grip more neutral and use your hands more to release the club and hit a golf ball? He said, I can't believe you asked that question. Yes, I've just been talking to my son Daniel about that. So Lee Trevino, pretty smart. Very rare that you're going to see a low core player. Here's the shark. Here's the shark. He doesn't look very rotated. Look at that right foot on the ground. Someone told me a story about Butch Harmon. He had a person that was working with him, said, my hips aren't rotated enough uh, at impact. And he said, well, look at Greg Norman. He was the number one player in the world. His right foot was flat on the ground. His hips were hardly rotated. I think one of the reasons why Butch has been so successful as he works with what people have. Here's Webb Simpson. I filmed this at the U.S. Open in 2019. You think that? There's upper core right there. Look at him, look at him posture up. Look at him go through. But what about Jordan Spieth? Well, here's low core. Watch how much he's in his left heel. You can't jump from out of your left heel. We know now, thanks to dual force plates, we jump more out of our front foot than our rear foot. So there's no way Jordan Spieth can get verticals if his weight's in his heel. He's going to have some, but he can't have as much as he would like or thinks he needs. So here's Jordan, and he's still not out of the woods with what he's trying to do in his golf swing. But look at that. Look at this in the heel. Look how rotated he is. We have believed he's low core. Here's an older Bernard Longer. He's Larry Rinker's age. He's month you can see looking kind of mid to maybe upper core there with that release and so you have all these different swings people say hey what about tiger well here's tiger before the last car wreck and uh you know he's looking a little more he definitely is looking more upper core he's 48 i believe this month so you can see how as we get older, we're all going to move toward being upper core. And here's Chris Kirk. I get asked a lot about him. They say, we think Chris Kirk's upper core, so look at him at impact. So there are some different swings for you. There's some things. And... Bottom line, I want to teach what you are. So if you're upper core, I'll show you how to swing as an upper core player. If you're mid, I'll show you mid. 
if you're low core, I'll teach you low core. Oh, I guess I could show you this. I could share the screen again. I could show you this uh, right here. Um, I think you're looking at Chris Kirk again here. Tell me if I'm not. Uh, you want to look at releases. So I'll show you Kathleen face on. This is low core. Look at the strong grip. Look at her hands at impact. See the low core player, the right arm isn't going to straighten to almost parallel to the ground. See this? Then upper core, upper core is going to release the earliest. So here I am, and I call it release point. This is something I came up with. Most of the stuff I've stolen. But where does the butt of the club point back at the center of the chest and all the energy has kind of come out of the right arm, hand, and wrist? Where does that moment happen? And you can see with Kathleen, it's probably... Probably her right arm in straight yet, yeah, right in here, probably right in there for her. So look at look at where she is. And then let's see if I got a face on of any of these guys. No. Um, let's see here. Well, I'll show you Lori. She tends to release a little bit earlier than... So, but you can see here she is releasing. Yeah, she's released a little early there too. <laughs> Here's Fred Funk, long, one of the best drivers of the golf ball ever. And you can see probably right in here, somewhere between these two frames is probably happening with him. So, and so you got three different impact alignments is what I'm trying to say. You have me here. So you have that. You have Fred, who's probably mid-core, somewhere in here. And then you have, let's see, let's look at, uh, let's look at my sister. Here's my sister. There's impact. So you can see the difference in the rotation. And then Kathleen at impact. So there isn't one impact alignment there's three upper mid and low core so i'm sure you have a lot of questions about all that so fire away so anybody who's got questions i know jeff started to chat jeff why don't you you take over and ask a couple questions just hit your space bar to unmute. Uh, that way we don't have everybody uh, yeah. talking at one. Uh, good evening, Larry. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, why is it then so much in fashion or in vogue when we cruise around YouTube um, and see that everybody's, you know, the, the YouTube instructors are trying to get everybody into that lower core impact position with so much openness and rotation of the lower body um that seems well, just to be I, common. I i think the interesting thing is people think that the faster you can rotate your body through the ball the further you will hit it so i think we really have had an epidemic with everybody's trying to get longer you know, everybody thinks right. if we can hit the ball further, we'll lower our handicap. Uh, and the interesting thing is if you've ever studied 3D models of golfers, the rotation in the body is ending somewhere, probably shaft parallel to the ground coming into the ball. Uh, it's slowing down. And if you look at a lot here, I'll share, I'll share the screen again with the, uh, I'll show you a long drive guy here. Here's Tim Burke, uh, who's two-time world long drive champ. He's a member at the Ritz Carlton. But you can see, see they, see all golfers are going to have lateral motion peaks first, rotary peaks second, and then the verticals keep kick in. And I have measured him, and he is mid core. Yeah. 
So if you look at him at impact, you can see, look at the verticals, verticals kicking in. But someone like him who's been recorded at 154 mile an hour club head speed, 222 ball speed, those were world records at one time. Uh, you know, bottom line, what's moving fast is the club head. So it's just Newton sixth grade physics for every action. There's an opposite and equal reaction. So I don't understand why people are teaching turn your bodies fast through the ball when the truth is they're slowing down. They're going yeah. slower. Uh, and, you know, what's going faster is the club head. So, but why is it in vogue? That's your question. Uh, I, I think everybody's trying to do the best right. job they can with teaching, but I would, I would simply say this, what's their playing career? What have they played in? Have they taken their methodology out and tested it under pressure? Do they actually have any street cred as far as playing this game? Right. And unfortunately, a lot of these people on YouTube don't. Yeah. So, it's, so I, I like your comment about, you know, it's all in the, the greedy need for speed, which seems to yeah. be one of the big things that's in in fashion, too. And, you know, how do we how do golfers get faster with through more rotation? Well, as you know, right, the hands are an incredible amount of contributors to to the factor of, of swinging the golf club. So. Is it not safer again for like we teach, you know, mid to high handicappers is what we do. Um, that's got to be way safer than trying to get them into so much lower core rotation and, and adding speed. Well, I'll say this. Safer is an interesting word. We already have kids getting hurt that have teachers trying to get them to rotate their bodies when their weight is in the balls of their feet. I had a kid come see me from Utah a couple of years ago, 120 mile an hour club head speed. And he was working with the top teacher in Utah that works with a top touring pro. You can probably figure out who it is. And this kid tore his labrum in both hips and had to have surgery. So the thing about it is people are ignorant to understanding that your stance width can change where the balance is in your feet. And I believe God made our body smart. So we're going to stand in a stance width we have strength as if we were going to lift a barbell or lift something up. And if you're upper core, you most likely are going to set up in a stance width where your weight's in the balls of your feet. We've also seen, depending on what sports people play, and you guys up in Canada love your hockey, but if you're, I had a hockey player from Canada recently, his weight, he's all, everything he's done, skating, everything he did was in the balls of his feet. So what do you think he's going to do when he grabs a golf club? He's going to have his weight in the balls of his feet. If his weight's in the balls of his feet, you can't rotate your hips. If you, Wherever any of you are at, stand up, put the weight in the balls of your feet, and try and rotate your hips like you're going through a golf shot, and you're going to feel them restricted. And if you if you put your weight in the middle of your feet and rotate your hips, you're going to be able to rotate them more. So, uh, look, I didn't know this stuff seven and a half years ago. I didn't know that my stance widths affected where my weight was. I do now. Right. And so it's and, you know, when I used to look at posture, I'd hear the on the TV commentator say, oh, look at his posture. It just looks so great. I'm like, well, what am I looking at? Am I looking at the back is straight? Does he have an old man C back or he's got an S back? What am I looking at? Now I understand I'm looking at knee flex and I'm looking at where the balance is. And upper core players are going to be in the balls of their feet with their knees bent the least. And, and low core players are going to squat like we saw Kathleen. They're going to have their weight in the middle and be the most squatty. And your posture affects how you pivot. If you set up with a lot of knee flex and your weight in the middle of your feet, it's really hard to pivot around your front post. It's real easy to move to your, 
your back yeah. foot. So, so how, how should we identify then? Is, is there something that we should do, um, you know, with our golfers uh, to okay, help Okay, so identify? that's a great question. That is a great question. I'm going to share, I'm going to share uh, my screen again. So I'm just going to pick out, let's see, I'm going to pick out, well, this kid's pretty good. Let's see. I was just going to pick out someone I saw recently. No, this kid's pretty good. All right. So here's an, you guys work with older or younger people? I would think the majority of us work with mid to to older population. We have we have some of our members do a lot of junior stuff, but I'm going to. All right. So here's a guy who's a good golfer. He's he's 72 or three. OK, you're going to see what he is. So here's a lot of times I will film someone. And like I said, the less I change, the better. So what am I going to look at? So the first thing I'm going to look at is their grip. Where's their grip? And we see people all the time where their grip is too strong. His grip looks upper core. He's got, he's just got a fairly neutral grip. He's just a little stronger than neutral. He's right there. I look at his knee flex, and this is kind of a cool drawing tool. I know from doing this that, you know, 157, 156 is kind of the bottom of upper core. So his posture looks upper core. So I'm going to look at that. Now, I'm going to look at his swing. You can see, he's got, look at this club back here. He's a good player. Club's right on plane. And now look at him at impact. He's hardly rotated. And another thing to look at is where is the trail elbow coming down? Look at the trail elbow behind the rib cage. Upper core players, this will be here. Low cord will be toward the navel. So that's a picture I'm always looking at right here. Where's that elbow? And then where is release point? Where does that right arm straighten? And I would say for him, it's about right there. Yeah. See the gear effect of the heel hit. So how far forward of impact is that? He's in an upper core range there. So I look at this player. OK. I look at this player and it's kind of nice with V1. We can set impact. So here's a dress. I can draw a line on his butt. I can say, OK, you're early extending. You're standing up. That's upper core. You're not very rotated. That's upper core. I look at his grip. It's upper core. I look at his his release point. It's upper core. I look at his right elbow behind his rib cage, upper core. He's all upper core. The tough ones are the juniors. They'll show up with a strong grip. So that's low core. They'll have their hips appear to be kind of mid core rotation and impact. But then you see them straightening their trail arm early, their right arm early if they're right handed. So which way do you go? <laughs> Am I going to teach him upper, mid, or low core? And that's where the right balance comes in to where the most important thing to check is we we get those nine stance widths, and the final test is which stance width you have the most strength in. Okay. Now, here's a test you all can do. I don't have my green screen behind me, so this could wave, but... How much if you if you stand if you if you put your right arm in this position like this how much can you bend it back without leaning back see that's all i have that's upper core if i was low core i could bend this thing back a ton right I use my phone i could bend well it <laughs> disappears i'll use this so that if I I could bend it way back if I was low core. So that's normally the first test I do is I see what how much external rotation do you have? See, that's another thing that's interesting, not to beat up TPI, 
But see, TPI, everything they do is based off of mid-core golf swing. Mm. So they get somebody that's upper core in and they're like, oh, well, we got to work on your flexibility and we've got to do this and we got to get you to where you can rotate that more. And we got to get you to where you can rotate your hips more and all this stuff. When the truth yeah. is they're pretty flexible, it's just their upper core. It's just the way God made their bodies. Right. I've measured I've measured 14 year old girls that are upper core. You know, it's wow. interesting. It comes down to where your strength is. Ladies, childbearing. We've seen ladies with big hips. Ladies are going to be the right. ones that are going to be more low to mid core. Doc Wright has gone to South Korea a couple times, more than that. But he told me about two trips. He worked with some KLPGA players. And first trip, they were all mid and low core, measured 40 players. Next trip, two were upper. So out of 80 to 90 players he measured, only two of the ladies were upper core. They were all, most were mid and some were low. But men, on the other hand, we believe two thirds of all men, all ages are upper core. And I really think back to the videos and the pictures I have of me from when I was a teenager, seeing myself push up, straighten up, which I didn't like the look of. Right. Uh, I I now realize that that is beautiful. That's upper core. It's okay. Yeah. But I there was a time that's who, that's who you are. There was a time I wanted to look like the way Adam Scott swing looks. You know? Yeah. Well, that's that's what I mean. You know, everybody wants to look like all those you know mid to lower core players, and as soon as we see somebody early extend, we you know. We throw our hands up in the air and go, oh, my gosh, that's early extension and we can't have that. Right. But we don't right, understand. Right. Right. That their, their bodies. You know, it, moving it really sad. It really saddens me that. Most of us are upper core and yet. No one's even heard of it. And a lot of you on tonight probably had never heard of the upper core swing before. And when I show you this stuff you probably think, oh, well, that's not how you want to swing a golf club. But look, I can tell you, I've been th I've been through the wars in golf. Yeah. Uh, I was trying, I was drinking the Kool-Aid. I was a turnaholic for a long time. In my mind, the longer the club took to get to the ball, the more rotated I could be. So I was trying to lag and rotate. That's low core with a really strong grip. Right. But I didn't understand it. And the thing about it is, the most important thing is these matchups. Right. Like the grips kind of match the hip rotation. Yeah. You see somebody early extend and stand it up, and they've got a strong grip. You know the grip's not correct. How, so many, that, the, how many of you have given a lesson, and you, you notice the grip probably is too strong, and in the first 20 balls that person hits for you, you see a swing that looks pretty good, and if they're right-handed, the ball goes left. And I look at that, when I see that, and I go, there's their golf swing. Their grip's just wrong. Yeah. But see, all of us, if we have an incorrect grip or an incorrect setup or posture, we are going to do something to make the white ball go at our target. And so, uh, you know, so we all do things. To make it happen and i think you know it's most people are upper core and if you have an older demographic like i do uh with your students i mean yeah. shoot you're let's just say this if you only taught one way how to swing a golf club and you taught upper core you would you would probably be 60 to 70 percent successful and if they're older you'd probably be 80 to 90 percent successful what you do right if so that answers one of the questions we had from paul uh he wanted to know the percentage uh what would the percentage be for the three types of swings today you did so you say it's a majority is upper core Yes, I would say, you know, Doc Wright, I, I kind of lean on him with some of these numbers. You know, I think we were used to saying two thirds of all golfers were upper core. And now he's kind of saying two thirds of male golfers are upper core. 
Uh, and and then with the ladies, I look, the younger you are, uh, the greater the chances are that you are could are mid core, mid to low. Most most people are going to be mid to upper. There's very few low cores. Yes. Uh, and if you film somebody and they can rotate that hard, then give them a strong grip, tell them to aim left if they're right-handed and hit a block <laughs> cut. Because every low core player was successful doing that. Whether it was Trevino or David Duvall or Paul Lazinger, Dustin Johnson, that's how they play. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's how Judy Rankin played. So uh, and I think it's really interesting when you talked about the uh, the Asian female about how you know, on his first trip over that more were uh, mid to lower core players. Um, I've done a little bit of reading and research into, uh, you know, Tai Chi and uh, martial arts and where the center of mass goes down through the tibia and the talus tends to be um, where the Asians find their balance points, which is more towards the heel than the ball of the foot. So I don't, that's just a, thought off the top of my head <laughs> no but that's a good thought because uh you know i remember i had a 14 year old girl that she was one of those ones where she had characteristics of all three and i didn't really know which way to go i tried to give her a strong grip and have her rotate and lag she made one swing and said i don't like that <laughs> So I, I made a phone call to Doc. I basically said, okay, I'm going to make her like a seven, which a seven, I'll share the screen again. So those of you that may be joined late, uh, you can see this. But uh, should be able to see the skeleton. Yes. The seven is the bottom of the upper core. The six is the top of the mid core. My sister is a six. So people that are sevens and sixes, we could say they're a hybrid. People that are threes and fours, we could say they're a hybrid. Okay. Right. So this girl, I measure her and said, okay, I'm going to put her at a seven. Okay. I'm going to put her slightly into the upper core. So I called Doc Wright that night and uh, asked him, I said, okay, Doc. And his question to me was, what sports has she played? I said, well, she's a tennis player. He goes, well, she's been playing out of the balls of her feet her whole life. So that's going to, she's going to feel much more comfortable there. I think your Tai Chi example is really good. Because, okay, now they're centered, you know, their their weight is more in the center of their feet toward their heel. That would make sense that when they picked up a golf club, they would they would balance there yeah. because that's what they've trained. Uh, so, yeah, I really believe the sports that people have played influence what you could be or not, you know. But yeah, I think that's always if you... But I think if you understand just a few key components, there's really four I always go over with my students. Number one, grip. Number two, how rotated are your hips? Number three, how do you pivot? Trail foot, center, front post. And then number four, where do you release? Where does your trail arm straighten? Early where everybody wants it, or really late, like a low-core player. So to me, those four things have to match. And cool. I was thinking the other day that the release, how they release the club might be the one that tips towards everything. So, uh, but But then I had a good player that had a little too strong of a grip. He could actually hold it off, even though he needed to release a little earlier than he was. So he actually had too strong of a grip for him, and he was uh, 
he he was able to strong enough to hold the face off and release later. So that was kind of interesting. See, that's one of the cool things about the right balance is we can tell people exactly where the hand should be on the golf club, what angle they should be. And I can do that blind with a beginner. Imagine being able to give a beginner the correct grip for them uh, yeah. when they start. Pretty amazing. So I would say, you know, the those South Korean girls, I most of them were mid-core. But the point of that story was very few were upper. None were upper the first trip. Two were upper the second trip. Uh, very so, interesting. But most were mid. But again, that's ladies. Uh, but hey, if you're working with somebody and this, if that's received their AARP card in the mail, means you're 50. Uh, and you're a male, boy, I got to think you're looking at 75 to 80 percent chance that you're going to be upper core. So thank you. Mark, really, go ahead. Yeah, I got a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, first one is, uh, is there a ball flight attached to proper upper core, mid core, lower core, or is it, uh, you know, the same as any golfer you get draws, fades straight? I think, uh, ball, as far as fading the ball or drawing the ball, uh, I don't, I don't think that's going to matter too much. Um, uh, so Look, what do we see all day long? People coming over the top of it, right? <laughs> so they're going to hit fades. So and upper core players can do that. Uh, but as far as how high they hit it, I would say upper core players with an earlier release would tend to hit the ball higher. Low core players with a really strong grip. See, that's one thing about ball position. If you look at uh, a low core player, uh, let's see here. If you look at a low core player, I'm just going into my models here. Like I, I was said, just about to say there, Larry, that that has to change, right? The ball position has to change for each yeah, of those. Yeah, ball three. position. Like here's Kathleen, who's low core. So if you look at her stance, which is slightly open, and you look at where her ball position is to her stance, she's back. So low yeah. core players are going to have the ball back with the most shaft lean, and the lead arm or left arm is going to be a straight line with the shaft. Whereas if you look at if you look at an upper core player um, like me, you're going to see the ball position much more forward. So if you look at calf lean at impact, look at the shaft lean, and then but just look at the hands, look at the handle, look at the grip, look at the body, and then you look at me at impact. And look at the way I look compared to her. So, yes, that's another thing. Low core players will play the ball the most back. Upper core players will play the ball most forward. So if you look at both of us at impact, what's the difference in shaft lean? Well, look at hers. 15 degrees of lean and I've got five. So that's a difference. You know, Lee Trevino low core player in his prime and what's the one major he didn't win he didn't win the masters and what did he say i didn't hit it high enough that's the one negative about being low core is it's hard to hit it high but if you've got 123 124 mile an hour club head speed like dustin johnson has uh, you got enough speed to get your jet in the air <laughs> Larry, second question. Uh, I'm 47, so I'm just going from, and I grew up playing basketball, so I'm really strong in the lower body and never been strong in the upper body. And I've been watching my own videos while you're talking here to try and identify things. But 
what I'm wondering is when do I start to become more upper cord? Like 47 seems to be a good age to uh, kind of revamp. I have no vertical force, though. No jump in my golf swing. There's zero. Uh, that's the one thing that I kind of personally sees missing. Well, I think it's different for each person. I, I've passed 47, 19 years ago. Uh, you're, you're right there. I think your ball flight's going to tell you. So if you find with your setup that you're not able to keep the ball from going left as a right-handed golfer, here, I'll share this with you something here that I think is important too. This is something I say to my students. So in regard to controlling the face, body rotation and keeping speed in your lead arm, both of these two things are face openers. So notice the club face is wide open. So what I'm saying to you, Mark, is if you can't rotate enough to keep the face uh, from closing early, maybe it's time to change your grip a little bit, okay? Now, an upper core player is going to feel the back staying at the target, but what happens if my left arm slows down, the club passes early, and I hook it? So if I do that, if I start hooking it, how do I fix it? Well, I've got to fix it with that lead arm being more forward and a little more rotated. That'll make the face more to the right. And then here's something I give to all my upper core players too. You see, and this maybe is why you are struggling a little bit getting verticals. But a big key is getting those hips square. Someone said, why is everybody teaching rotation, rotation, rotation? Well, now all of a sudden you got a guy setting up with his hips open. He's, he's uh, kind of trying to get a head start on getting those hips rotated. Well, if you set up with your hips open as an upper core player, you can't make that proper pivot where you turn without swaying. And then slot the club. That's just get the club on plane. And then this is what we see all day long, an early turn from the top. So we see someone. We see someone from the top. They get here. You guys ever seen this move? <laughs> ever seen that move right there? There you go. The damage is done, folks. Right there. It's over. Okay. That's the crime scene. Right, right. <laughs> So, uh, but anyway, it, I think it's important to teach people how to control the face. So if you're lagging and rotating, look at the face, it's wide open, but I don't have the correct grip to have that face square. That's Dustin Johnson. But upper core, we feel keeping our back at the target longer and then now we let that club head go, and now I can get the club back and match up. See, what we're all really trying to do is match up these body rotations with the club head. And I don't care if your name's Jack Nicholas or Tiger Woods, if you go early from the if you go early from the top, if you do that, you can't catch up. So then maybe you got to feel keep in the back there and go out and hit some draws. You know, old school, if guys were hitting the ball to the right, they went to the range and hit hooks. And then when they went back to their natural swing, it straightened it out. And then guys that were overhooking it, they went out and hit cuts. And then that, that got them back to what they needed to do. But to answer your question, I think you'll know when you make what you feel like is a pretty good swing, hit it in the center of the face, and the ball's going a little left. Because, you know, it, it's funny. I remember I had this lady who I measured her. She was kind of a new golfer. And I measured her and said she was a seven upper core. And I kept seeing her clear her hips. And she just kept blocking the ball to the right as a right-handed golfer. And I said to her one day, I said, 
you know, I think you might, I might have mismeasured you. You, you might be mid-core. And your head like exploded, like, oh my God, I've been working so hard on this one. Now I got to go learn another one. And I was like, no, it's just, we're going to make your grip stronger. <laughs> so that's all we're really going to change. So you can get the face more square. So she thought it was like, you know, that was all this different stuff she needed to do. But you talk about jumping here. I'll show you this. Uh, I really believe... Mark, if you pivot correctly, you will you will use verticals. Maybe you're low core, Mark. Here's JT. Here's another fad, folks. Keeping that club head outside your hands. I'm not a fan of that either. Uh, and then watch this. See, he's going to rotate and jump. Now, if you look at him here, it looks like he's really rotated. But... The crease in his pants is actually about right there. And he's just got this knee kicked out that makes it look like he's more rotated. But look how he jumps. This is a big difference between, between a mid-core and a low-core player. See, if we look at Spieth, see, Spieth is going to be in his heel and nowhere near jumping like Justin did. That's a big difference that you will see between them. You look at Kathleen. Kathleen, uh, where is she? Low core. You look at Kathleen, here she is at impact. See? Really rotated. Look where her weight is in her heel, left heel. So that's another thing people do. I get students all the time. Yeah, they're trying to rotate, get that weight in the left heel so they can rotate their hips more. Like somehow magically, that's going to help them hit the ball better. Well, what about I've watched the, your swings in those last few there, Larry, and I don't see this drop to pop. Right, I don't see them actually going down. You know, transitioning their their weight shift, pressure change to the front foot, and there's a decrease you know, in their head posture and position, they, they go down so they can use the ground to pop up and jump up through the ball. Like, again, that's whether that's exaggerated in this new fashion trend that's out there. Um, is that a conscious thought for you personally as an upper core player? Do you feel like you want to go down to go up? Well, that's loading a vertical. Yeah. Doing that. Uh, I'll say this. It's not that often when I play golf that I say, okay, I'm going to try and really time. I'm going to really try and time jumping. Like it's like a skater. We make this little shift. And like you say, we can lower a little bit and, and, and create a little bit of load of vertical, but then we rotate into a jump and we actually use a lot more torque than people think because we've turned our hips a lot more in the backswing. See, if you look at me here, you will see that I get, look at how deep that right hip is and see there I come in. See, I'm actually not going down much here. Now I'm pushing up and jumping. See, look where my head is. I'm, I'm up here. We don't have you quite on the screen there, Larry. Oh, sorry. Maybe I, right. didn't click, I didn't click this. There we go. Oh yeah, so yeah, that, you, that looks up there. So look where my head is here. Yeah. So I'm not actually going, hey, I'm going a little down there, but then look at the jump. So mm -hmm. there's a dress, there's impact, and then there's a dress, see? Yeah. And if you look at me down the line, you can certainly see how much I jumped there, okay? So, uh, but that big turn the right hip, a little shift, and then ro we rotate into a jump. We don't clear the hips. Uh, but I'm just saying, I don't really try and do that too much. We were looking at, at this at Justin Thomas. You know, it's interesting. He jumps so much off his left foot that if you look at the trace down here, he only has 15% of his weight in his left foot. And then I think there's one frame here where it goes, uh, it's one before it maybe. There's one, yeah, only 7% of 
of his weights in his left foot. Well, why? Because he's jumped. He's almost left the ground with his left foot. Yeah, yeah he's off okay. the planet. It's off the planet. That's why this skinny little guy hits it a long way. <laughs> But I'm just saying, trying to load verticals, trying to time that with matching it up with your arms, hand and wrist swing and the club, yeah. you've got to time that. And right. so, mm -hmm. hey, when I'm when I got my flight scope out and I'm trying to see how fast I can swing for an old fart. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm trying to rotate and jump like crazy. Yeah. But yeah. when I go play golf, I'd only do it on a par five if I felt like I needed a little more. And the truth is, when I have my flight scope out, I might get another one to two mile an hour club head speed, which yeah. is five yards. Yeah. So, uh, hey, but, Larry, there's yes. a question from Paul Kelly in the East Coast in Newfoundland. Okay. Hi, Larry. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. I got a question for us off the topic a little bit. Why did, when we hit probably the early 90s somewhere, instruction gets so complex and so focused on posi positions rather than trying to make the ball go a particular place? Well, part of that was due to the instructors. I found out, I didn't realize this, but I found this out in the last couple of years, that P1, P2, P3, that is all Mac O'Grady. That is Mac O'Grady's interpretation of the golfing machine. So Mac came you know, up with all that. The other sports I've, all the other sports, I've played hockey for 55 years or so, and... Not once in that 55 years have I thought about what the blade does to the puck when I shoot a puck. But I'm always focused on where it's going. And it right. seems like that lead better, it seems like that lead better era that came along early 90s. It was like the complexity justified the prices. Uh, is, is that what happened? Well, Ledbetter was definitely doing that. I had a lesson with him and went into his office and we spent 45 minutes showing me different positions in different parts of the golf swing. Ledbetter's first book came out in 1989 and he used David Frost as his model. Uh, and so he went over positions. You know, Jim McLean has positions that he teaches and his his teachers go through training for that. I think they have variances in each one of the positions. I haven't studied Jim's stuff, although I've had some golf lessons from him. Uh, but Mac is the one that that came out with these positions, and it was really in the 80s. I remember when he was working with Jody Mudd and Chip Beck and Steve Pate, and all three were playing some pretty good golf in the mid to late eighties. So, uh, but yeah, you know, look, we all were running around with our $2,500 camcorders shooting 60 frames per, uh, 60 frames per minute or per second, excuse me, 60 yeah. frames per second. Now my iPhone shoots 240. but yeah, I know what I've seen I, more and more over the last couple of years is, my students come in and I'll ask them, you know, okay, what's, what's going on? What are, what are you seeing? And they'll talk to me about positions and they, I have to draw it out of them after four or five times of what's your ball doing? Right. Where is your ball going? And they'll keep focusing on, well, I'm standing up and I'm not in this position, but they've watched so much stuff online that they forget that their ball is supposed to go somewhere. Right. I, have you, look, have you seen have you seen that phenomena grow? Uh, well, I think there, we have another thing going on is with the launch monitors, kids want to hit and they don't even watch the ball fly. They want to see what their numbers were. So we've got that yeah. going on too. But the, the question I always ask in the beginning, I think just a great tip for all you teachers is when you're, when you're given a golf lesson, I interview them. Hey, what's your handicap? Where are you from? What sports did you play? What's the best you've ever been? If it's somebody 60, 70 years old. 
And then I ask the question, what's the shot you're hitting that you feel is hurting your game the most? I ask that question. And you have probably asked that question. They go, well, I feel like I'm just not in the right position here. <laughs> exactly. You have to you have to keep drawing it out of them to get right, the, right. What's the ball doing. Right. right. And you go, let's talk about the ball, not your body, but the ball. Because that's another thing. Yeah. I want people dissecting their shot. What did the ball do? What did the club do to make the ball go where it went? And then uh, lastly, what did your body do? But you're right. Most people talk about the body. I ask people all the time. I say, name the five ball flight laws. Name the five things that make the ball go where it goes. And every, I, I tell you what, I would say the pass fail rate where they get four out of five is probably 10 or 15%. People don't know. And they don't even know. They can't even give you a club face and path. Yeah. Uh, which is really what you're going to focus on a lot. But angle of attack, club head speed, where you hit the ball in the club face, you know, mm -hmm. those are your five. And it's, you know, look, a lot of what we got to do is educate. And I will say this too. Guess what I changed the most with people when they come see me? Up here, what are they thinking? Because they all have misconcepts of what they're supposed to do. They all think they're supposed to do something and they're different. Hmm. And guess what happens when I have somebody upper core that's been trying to lag and rotate? And here, I'll share this screen with you and show you guys this. Because this is what I do. This is what I do with people. I get them to set up with a closed stance and twist their body the opposite way of their hips open, close them up. And if they're upper core, I want them turning and not swaying. And can they swing out, let the club catch up and go past their body? This is what I, this is the drill I have them do all the time right there. And guess what they say? They say, oh, well, that's 180 degrees, Larry, from what I've been told I need to do. <laughs> I think you've got a lot of people out there that I would just call them intermediate teachers that they just got one dog and pony show, meaning they have one way that they know that they think that way they teach and they they can present their curriculum well and they just everything is, hey, turn, turn, turn and big muscles control the little muscles. And, yeah. and as you said right in the beginning, Mark, did it, how's it working for you? You know, I mean, I have people all the time come for putting and short game lessons. I say to them, I go, you wouldn't be here if what you were trying to do was working. <laughs> they go, you're right. Thank so you. We're always, we're always changing. We're always changing concepts. And it's, uh, it, like I said at the beginning, you know, it just saddens my heart that this upper core swing, and I'm so glad Mark invited me to present tonight because it's it's so sad to me that this model isn't out there because most of us are upper. And as we all get older, this is how we're going to have to swing a golf club. And And so I want people out playing golf and enjoying golf and all the great things that come with golf. Things you're playing with your family, your friends. Uh, it's just, it's the greatest game ever. And it's its just sad that, you know, I, I've had a lot of people come, Larry, you're my last hope. And I go, okay, I'll do what I can. But I think a lot of people blame themselves when they're not getting better. By the way, you're recording this, so... I'll uh I'll refrain from saying what I was gonna say, but uh there's it's someone that's a well known player that's got a new coach and it's hard to watch. Hard to watch what she's working on. <laughs> hey Larry. Hey, uh, uh, once you once you've identified a player as upper core, and they're a decent player, maybe a 12 handicap or so, and short game aside. I mean, you've addressed uh, many of the issues uh, all night. What 
what would you say would be you know three areas in their swing that, that you would work on and develop so they could maybe reduce their index by a few strokes well great question emmanuel and it's it's really uh the the i would go back to these four keys i would go back to uh and i'll share the screen again but i would go back to these four keys right here uh number one they got to have their hips square to dress See, people are setting up with the left hip open and the foot flared so they can rotate more. No, they got to do the opposite. So that's a setup. And then secondly, they've got to make the correct pivot. And Mark, my knee-jerk reaction to you that you feel like you're not using verticals, I would bet your hips are open and you're not pivoting correctly would be correct. my Correct, correct, 100%. My okay. And all you got to do is set up and sway off the ball and then say, how do I get back from here? And then if you sat there and turned and kept your weight on your front foot and made a little shift toward the ball of your left foot, you would go, oh, I can I can get there from here. Um, so, but anyway, to answer your question, Emmanuel, Let's make sure the hips are square. Let's make sure they're making the correct pivot. And let's make sure they're swinging the club head past the chest. I get people, I put people, uh, I put people right here at the top of the swing. And I come over and hold their shoulders. And I say, okay, I want you to get the club head past the ball as I'm holding your shoulders. And guess what happens? Almost all of them go, they're, they're trying to move it with their, their big muscles like this. And the club, they look like this. I'm like, no, I want this. I want this, cl I want this club getting catching up and going by you. That's what you want. You know, and it's, somebody said something about flipping the other day on social media. You know, flipping to me is when... The golf club is past your lead arm at impact. If you look at me, that golf club is not past my lead arm at impact. And if you notice, it is now. So somebody would say, oh, that's early. You released early, Rinker. No, that's just upper core. But to answer your question, Emmanuel, bottom line, you've got the setup, you've got to pivot correctly, and you got to understand the sequencing of the upper core swing is we release the earliest and the club catches up and goes past us. Okay. That would be the keys. And then just set up with, uh, do that close stance drill because that will help them to do it. That will help that because you've contorted their body where they can't use that big engine, the big muscles to rotate through. Larry, there's a question from <laughs> How much do you use your wrist to add speed? Mark, you cut out there. You're muted, Mark. How much do you use your wrist to add speed? Uh, so my mentor is Bob Toski. And your hands and wrists are the greatest speed producers in the swing. I get a kick out of people saying that the hands and wrists are passive. You know, I want to slap them with an active hand and wrist. <laughs> and tell them that they're very active. How active do you want me to hit you with them? <laughs> but people think they're passive. Uh, but your hands and wrists can add speed. You know, it was interesting uh, out at Red Sky and Vale. I was out there with uh, Gary McCord. And he's always kind of, he spent a bunch of time with Mac O'Grady. He was with him eight or 10 years. And it was always great to talk to Gary. I learned a lot from Gary. Uh, he spent a lot of time with O'Grady. But I remember he was hitting balls and we had, the flight scope there. And I said, come on, use your hands, whip it a little more. And he got two mile an hour faster in the next swing. 
And that's really a lot to change in one swing. Uh, and so he was like, wow. So, but your hands and wrist are your greatest speed producers in the swing. And, but the support system is your weight has to support the motion. And Bob Toski 101, if you look at me at impact and look where I am, my weight's in my front foot. My weight on my front foot supports my lead arm, my left arm, which supports my wrist and hand and the club. That's the support system. I I did a thing uh, during the PGA show this year, and I talked about a supported strike. And all these guys came up to me. I've never heard of a supported strike. I'm like, what? You know, where you're in your left foot and you're hitting against your left side and your left arm. I was, I was, uh, how many of you have never heard the term supported strike? You know, that's, that's where you're hitting against it. The truth is what happens after this, who cares? That's my release. And I'll show you someone that uh, is one of my favorites. Now he's a lot bigger than I am. But the big easy, here he is, young guy, but here he is. Look at that backswing on the guy behind him. See, there he is. There, someone's talking him. about Ledbetter. This is at Ledbetter. Look at that backswing. But I watch the big, watch the big, look at this and look at the way he looks right there. No wonder he hits it so far. He's got to share it with us. Let's see that screen. screen. Larry, you didn't share the screen. Oh, I didn't share it. I'm sorry. I thought I did. There's the big easy at impact or past impact. So look at this. Oh, here's the guy. See the guy there? Look, he's got the handle going first, club outside his hands, then trying to set it. And then here's Ernie. And look at this. Look where he's at here at impact. And then there's the supported strike. And then look at that right there. So. I love these videos. So, I mean, that's just, look at that release. Some people say, oh, that's too much crossover. That's, uh, someone was talking about positions. You know, it's funny, but my friend James Light, some of you may know him. He's the guy that taught me how to use the track man launch monitor. He said, Larry, impact four ten thousandths of a second. It's the only time the ball's told what to do. I, I want to share something with you guys. I'm going to pull it up here. But I want to share one of my favorite pictures that I like to show my students. Let's see, where is it? It'd be right here. Here we go. All right, I'll share this with you guys. Can you see that? So four of those six players have won two majors. Look at the difference of just the left wrist at the top. Not one of those swings would be considered textbook at the top. JT would be closest, but his left arm, I think we'd all agree, is a little too vertical. Right? You guys all agree with that? Can I see some heads nod? <laughs> See, this is style. This is style. And pretty interesting, the careers all these guys have had. So what about I this? Love, I, I love showing that picture to my students. What about this sexy flattening that we all are pulling our hair out, forgetting it? It's like nobody flattened until two years ago. Well, it's interesting. You got George Gankus, way overrated. And his star pupil is Matt Wolf. I don't see, you know, Miller Barber. That's Miller Barber's swing from way back when. But 
this idea that you keep the club outside your hands and drop it in and then hit it. And then, oh, some guy starts taking a dead inside and working back to the plane that's kicking everybody's butt, named Victor Hovland. So imagine if Victor Hovland thought he needed to take it back like Matt Wolf. He believed that. Imagine if Jim Furyk thought that he needed to swing like Nick Faldo. You know, it's funny. They have Nick Faldo's 96 swing when he beat Greg Norman or Greg Norman beat himself in the Masters. And then you got Tiger 2000. They say that's the best Tiger swing, right? You know, so I think all that stuff's very hard. The truth is, I think, I think there's very few tour players that can make changes like Faldo and Tiger did and still be successful. We've, you know, that we've seen so many guys go to work with different teachers. Look at Ricky Fowler. Look at what he went through, and now he's back working with Butch. I remember I was on the range with Sean Foley a few years ago. He's working with Hunter Mahan. He walked over to me and whispered to me, Larry, I've been telling him the same three things for three years. <laughs> but like you said, Mark, when you find what works for somebody, that's what you do. And I will say that with my students, a lot of time when they come back for the next lesson, I just got to get them to exaggerate a little more sometimes what they need to do to get them hitting the ball the way they want to. So... But yeah, I'll tell you what, I, I my policy is I don't post stuff on other people's posts. I don't criticize other teachers online. They, it's their page. It's their story they want to tell. So good luck. But I, I post my stuff and I get some naysayers and I just delete it. I'm not I'm not going to get into an argument with somebody that has 25 followers, you know, and I've, I've done it a couple of times. What's your street cred to even make a comment? And then they get all, they get all mad about that. Hey, Larry, it's uh, eight 30 and uh, you've been great for 90 minutes. Can you, can you wrap up with one thing about pitching? Because I know you're passionate about what the, uh, the, the current uh, technique is and what it should be, um, if you don't mind. No, no, I'll be glad to. Um, let me uh, let me share this screen again. So it's kind of interesting that see upper core really ties in beautifully with what I believe about a pitch shot. So I'm a guy that, that uses the bounce. And as most of you know, the more you lean a shaft forward, the less bounce and loft you have in the club. That's why I'm always saying loft equals bounce. So I'm always saying if you have, if you have uh, not a lot of shaft lean that, you know, you're going to have some bounce. So bottom line to me, what's important is the weight flows into the front foot. You want to match the address shaft lean in this one to three inch window in front, but the club is gone. The left wrist is cupping and going into extension. So I'm teaching this. Now, a lot of people teach pull turn and keep the face open. And see, here's what I call the miss of the open face sandwich. They, they want to say you control this distance with your pivot. You hear Phil Mickelson, hinge and hold. Boy, that is some bad language right there. So if you look at me here, well, there's hinging. I've got a lot of angle. I'm supposed to hold that angle? Hinge and hold? No. What happens when I hit the ball? You got to let that angle go to find the ball, don't you? So hinge and hold is just not true. And then they want you to pull, turn, and keep the face open. And I like showing this. I believe in a free orbit, if you barely hang on to the club, the club face will rotate right up the plane 
There's the club face slightly open. It started slightly open. So this is how I teach short game. And really the best, uh, the best steep to make you steeper. Steeper always means steeper angle of attack and you're going to hit the ground further forward. So the best steep is the weight flows into the left foot. The good shallow is the early upper core player release. And then the good neutral is the club is on plane. And I, I tend to take it pretty vertical. And then there's the club pretty much on plane coming in there. Okay. Now, it's popular right now. How many of you have seen Joseph Mayo's post? who's been working with Victor Hovland. So he's been working with, uh, you know, hitting these low pitch shots, low spinners, they call them. And I'm trying to see if I saved one. I actually had somebody hit one recently that it worked for him. But bottom line, they're setting up with a ton of forward shaft lean. Let's see. Trying to find it here. That's me. Let's see. Oh, uh, this is just a guy. So there's a flop. See, there's the correct release right there. Um, I guess I don't have one. Don't have one. But anyway, I can talk about it. So, Victor Hovland, Coach Joseph Mayo, was known as Trackman Maestro on Twitter. And... Basically, when he worked with Victor, he showed Victor what his numbers were. So he showed him what his angle of attack was, showed him what his launch window was, showed him how much dynamic loft he had at impact, showed him what his spin rate was. So what's popular right now, and all the handle draggers do it, Jordan Spieth does it this way. And I saw a thing on Twitter or somewhere, Ben Crane showing this shot and showing you the numbers. And so uh, bottom line, they're looking for around 4,600 to 5,000 RPMs uh, on about a 15-yard shot. You play the ball back, you lean the shaft, and with the 58-degree wedge, you're hitting it with 45 degrees aloft. So a lot of forward shaft length. Now, the interesting thing about that shot is if you pull through, you probably won't stick it in the ground. If you release it the way I like to, you might stick it in the ground. So all those guys kind of drag through. Now, I had a student in the last couple of weeks, I was looking for his video, but I had a student in the last couple of weeks who was, too, was very steep and was struggling. Because I think you're going to find short game people. You have people that are born floppers. They use their hands and wrists and release the way I like it. And then, but there are they're born, they just low trajectory. Low trajectory, the club doesn't pass your lead arm much. And so, uh, but this guy was kind of a low trajectory releaser. And so I said, okay, let me show you this shot with Victor Hovland. We put it back in the stance, lean the shaft, start hitting these low spinners with his lob wedge. And he was happy because he was hitting every shot the way he wanted to. He's like, oh, I love that. And to me, short game, Mark, is really about, it's like being a good carpenter. It's like the more shots you have and that you trust and you can do, you know, there's more things you can do around the green. And then having said that, I really think there's a low release and there's a high release. And I'll show this to you um there is a high release and there is a low release so if you look at both of these going through here's your low release releasing against the lead arm club not going much past it that was this gentleman and then you have the high release where the left wrist goes into extension and cups 
So depending on what type of shot you're trying to hit, there's really a high release and a low release. And I say to my students all the time, there's really a low shot and a high shot, it's just a matter of which one you want to do. And then you can set up differently to hit different trajectories around the greens. I notice your your stance is pretty square. It's slightly open. Uh, I'll share this again to show you. If you look at me down the line, these rods on the ground, this yellow rod here represents the target where I wanted the ball to land. I say in my publications that I want that orange rod I just drew five feet left of that at 20 yards. And then that establishes a slightly open stance. And then the blue rod is the club face. I want that about five feet right of the target at 20 yards. And that's now the lines on your sandwich should be perpendicular to that. So it's a slightly open stance and club face. And then most people short game, they, they just make a miniature golf swing with what they're doing. And that's why you see a low core player like a Jordan speed who wants to be more of a puller and a turner and a handle driver. And that's why he likes playing those low spinners with a lot of shaft lane. And then you have the upper core players that are more throwers. You know, it's, it's funny how Phil Mickelson doesn't even come close to doing what he says he does. I mean, it, it's just amazing. I would love to film him, hit a flop shot. Now tell me what you did. Well, here, you know, it's kind of like throw that red hanky that we see on these commercials now here in the United States. We just throw, they throw this hanky. Let's go back to the replay. Let's see what you actually said. Well, okay, Phil, let's see what you actually did here. And all of a sudden, he's going to see the release. And he's going to go, oh, tour players are notorious for telling you what we think we do, not what we really do. So as a teacher, I kind of learned what I really do. And I could tell you stories about what I was thinking in my swing. And then when I saw it, I was like, holy cow, that looks totally different than what I think I'm doing. So that's well, some short game stuff there for you, Mark. Yeah. No, you know what? Tonight's been a, just a fantastic evening. Um, I, everybody's been sending messages through of, uh, you know, of thanks for, uh, for your knowledge and sharing your knowledge with us. It's, uh, it's pretty incredible really to, uh, to hear this stuff and see this, um, uh, all, everything and and for you to take the time and be on with us it's uh it's amazing and and for those that didn't hear at the beginning larry's got a couple of uh ebooks that he's going to share with us that you guys will get for free um and that's yeah that's dynamite information as well um but uh we'll definitely watch this recording over and over again and uh, i'll send you uh, a, a link to our youtube if you ever want to use it for anything but uh um you know larry i you've you've over delivered tonight for sure uh, well thank you i really i'm glad that i'm able to get this information out it's not about my ego it's about us helping people play better golf that's what it's about and again, if you just think about, if you just take this and go, okay, there's an upper mid and low core and the grip has to match their hip rotation and then the pivot has to match that and then how they release the club has to match that. If, if you just take those four concepts and get people matched up, see, I think really the whole thing now today is about getting people matched up and, and the less you change about their swing, the better. But this idea, this this rotation over rotation, turn, 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 and take the club back outside and shut and then just spin your hips through the ball. I mean, that just seems to be a bad fad going through, you know, and it's, uh, you know, but it's been really great being with you. You Canadians, I loved playing in the Canadian Open. Uh, got to play at Glen Abbey a bunch and then a couple times at Royal Montreal 
and uh, everybody always great up there, friendly. I know that Titusville is kind of a, or used to be a place for the Canadian uh, Golf Association, Royal Oak. Yeah. Used to be a place, yeah. but, uh, you know, I have Canadians. It's funny. I see like my website, more people. I have a lot of Canadians that uh, check my stuff out. And I would just say at the end, I have over 400 videos on my YouTube page. There's a lot more out there on this. Uh, and really keep it simple with your students. That's what I try to do. I'm always circling back to, hey, you just got to pivot better, Mark. You got to turn and not sway and let it go. And at the end of the day, it might be that simple for someone. Yeah. And, and then, you know, the, the best part now is uh, we feel like we can share some of your stuff without feeling like we're stealing it. Like I have for the last year. And uh, to be honest, my teaching in, in the last year is probably the best year I've ever taught. I've seen more progress. I've seen people, um, you know, with less pain and easier, uh, easier on their back and their hips and, um, I can't wait to get in and hit some balls in my uh, my little studio and <laughs> do some filming on my lower body, to be honest with you, because uh, I think it's going to get better and better. But Larry, from, from the bottom of all our hearts, we're a pretty big family up here. We have got a great group of people. Uh, just want to thank you so much for, uh, for coming through. Uh, you're a bit of a celebrity and for you to show up when you said you would show up, it's really means the world to us, you know? Uh, so good luck with this weekend. I know you're going to be there schmoozing and having a great weekend. Uh, so that should be fun too. Yeah, it should be fun, you know, and, uh, never know, you know, it's, it's going to be fun though. It's always fun to see old friends and, uh, you know, it's 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 become such a great event. You know, it is Christmas time and nothing better than spending time with your families uh, this time of year. And it's really a family event, the PNC Championship. So uh, going to be fun. So Merry Christmas to everyone. And Merry Mark, Christmas. thanks for Merry having Christmas. me. It's really been a it's really been my pleasure to be with you all this evening. Thank you. Yeah, we're very Thank grateful you. to have you on. Thank you, Larry.